Yeah, thanks. Thanks everyone for joining. Um, so my name is Jordan. Uh, I'm the program coordinator at B-City Canada, uh, and I'll be teeing up our webinar today. Uh, so this webinar is called Bylaws that Build Biodiversity, Empowering Residents to Create Pollinator Habitat on Private Land. Uh, so I'm going to begin by acknowledging the land that we're seated on today. Uh, we acknowledge that the land we're meeting on is traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, uh, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Uh, so thanks everyone for joining our webinar today. It's, it's great to see such a positive turnout, um, not only from municipal employees, but also people with all kinds of backgrounds. Uh, so today we're gonna be discussing the benefits of creating pollinator habitat on private land and how municipalities can empower residents uh, through bylaws to do this. Uh, so many municipalities have environment and biodiversity strategies that express the goal to help pollinators, uh, but then at the same time have bylaws that make it difficult for residents to take part in some of the actions uh, that can help pollinators. Uh, so one of the best ways for residents to support pollinators is to create habitat on their own properties. And that's why it's really important that municipalities empower people to do so in a clear way, uh, rather than limiting what's allowed through confusing bylaws that set aesthetic standards. Uh, so luckily now we're seeing a lot of interest from municipalities and how they can support pollinators through their bylaws. Uh, and many are reviewing bylaws to reshape them in a way that aligns with their goals to support pollinators. Uh, so we're delighted to have four speakers today uh, to discuss this. Uh, I'll introduce them more thoroughly in a moment, uh, but first we have Joyce Hostin and Vicki Wojcik who will discuss naturalized properties and the benefits they have for pollinators, uh, also the ecosystem and people more broadly. Uh, and then we have Patricia Landry and Emma Boley from the City of Toronto who will discuss how to craft bylaws that empower people to create habitat. Uh, and they're gonna walk through the specifics of recent changes uh, to the Toronto Grass and Weeds Bylaw as an example. Uh, so Joyce Hostin is a rewilder who dreams of city streets lined with fruit and nut trees, wild parks and wild yards. Uh, raised on a farm where a family grew, foraged and preserved enough produce to last the year, Joyce is now exploring what it means to be in conversation with a forest garden on her lawn free uh, quarter acre lot. A master gardener and permaculture designer, Joyce coaches people on foodscaping and wildscaping as a new approach to gardening in a changing climate. She helped design and plant Kingston's first two public food forests, is co-founder of Little Forests Kingston, and now has her sights set on a foresting the city with indigenous little forests. Uh, Vicki Wojcik has a PhD in environmental science policy and management from UC Berkeley and has been working to protect and promote pollinators with pollinator partnerships since 2011. As director of Pollinator Partnership Canada, she oversees research and programs, keeping on top of new and emerging pollinator issues and managing programs that includes pollinator habitat conservation uh, and landscape management assessments, understanding and enhancing agroecosystems, land use and pesticide policy review, support for threatened and critical species and ecosystem service assessments in Canada. Uh, Patricia Landry is the Natural Environment and Horticulture Park Programs Officer at the City of Toronto uh, and has been working for the city for 34 years. In her current role, she coordinates educational outreach programs, runs the City of Toronto Garden Contest, provides support to local community greening efforts, uh, and is the citywide inspector for naturalized gardens. Patricia was a co-lead on the pollinator protection strategy for the city of Toronto and recently co-led the city's review of the grass and weeds bylaw. Uh, and last but not least, Emma Bully is a policy development officer with the city of Toronto's municipal licensing and standards division. Earlier this year, she co-led the city's review uh, of the grass and weeds bylaw with Patricia to modernize regulations and support Toronto's efforts to protect pollinators and biodiversity. So that covers our introductions um, and we should have a bit of time left at the end for questions. Uh, so if you have any questions, please type them in the Q&A uh, and I'll ask as many as we have time for then. Uh, so without further ado, I will turn it over to our speakers. Um, so Joyce, feel free to share your screen and take it away.
<laughs> Thanks, Jordan. Now, as a master gardener, I often get questions like this one. What pest is eating my plant? In this case, it's a red one, and I see that in my red one all the time as well. But what if we reframe that and said, like, who is this being that's visiting my plant? Why are they here? Questions like Robin Wall Kimmer asks about plants. And in this case, it's a leaf cutter bee harvesting pieces of the leaves for its nursery. One of our best pollinators, these leaf cutter bees, and aren't they beautiful when you see them up close? Charles Darwin says the naturalist suffers a pleasant nuisance not to be able to walk 100 yards without being tied to the spot by some new and wondrous creature. And aren't these are wondrous creatures that we could be finding in our yards if we were to change how we saw them. Deva Abrams, who's written a few wonderful books, says magic. In its perhaps most primordial sense is the experience of existing in a world made up of multiple intelligences. The intuition that every form one perceives, from the swallow swooping overhead to the robber fly hunting prey, the luna moth overwintering in leaves, forest ants planting our spring wildflowers, hornworms hosting brachnoid wasp babies, to the fly, predator beetles lying in wait for prey, to the fly on a blade of grass, and indeed the blade of grass itself, is an experiencing form, an entity like this assassin fly with its own predilections and sensations, not just for other persons, but for other sentient organisms, albeit sensations that are very different from our own. But most of us have lost our belief in magic, learning instead to discipline plants and ourselves during what Anna Singh calls the plantation of scene, the world that's been created by violent ecological simplification. This is a palm oil plantation and you can see the rainforest being cut down for it. A world of displaced, coerced and violently disciplined plants. A world that we have in our cities, our lawns, and not just in Kingston, this is Toronto, Texas, Saudi Arabia. The world disciplined by mowing. Mowing, which uh, this is my son's yard and a no mow made his bird's nest was uh, laid there and we fortunately found it before bylaw came by and told him he had to cut his lawn. Ranking, destroying the habitat of species like um, fireflies, which like many species are declining. Fireflies who would be helping us out by eating the slugs and snails in our yard were we to allow them to be. Blowing, leaf blower minus is one of my, uh, <laughs> one of my ones that really gets me. They're disturbing the luna moth nests or killing the luna moth nests and all those other moths and butterflies who would otherwise overwinter. Fertilizing, which um, displaces or pollutes our streams and causes um, algae, algae blooms and uh, kills species, applying herbicides that end up in all kinds of beings, including us, spraying pesticides, which are killing not just our bees, but also all the creatures like the birds who depend on them. Shining our yard, which means cutting down the homes of so many species who would otherwise live there. Importing invasive species like this uh, burning bush. And this all results in no food, no shelter, and no place to raise a family for all of these other beings. And if we consider these actions, Paul Robbins of Lawn People says, I repeat it from household to household, block to block across densely yarded regions of suburban areas. We can begin to imagine the rhythm of whole neighborhoods and being whole cities synchronized with the habits and the noise of caring for grass. The idea of lawns being somehow compulsory is a largely British idea. And this is Noel Kingsbury, passed on like a raging infection, a product of colonization. Lawns are monocultures and monocultures, and this, I don't know if you can see, but this is basically a dead lawn because there are creatures like the June bug that adore monocultures. They have a lot of babies, which I don't know if you've ever spotted them. 
but they attract skunks. So there are some other creatures who do like the monocultures, raccoons, crows. And so instead of disciplining plants, battling for control and using things like pesticides when our control is faltering, we could enter into a conversation with the more than human world. This is Culver's Root in a friend's yard. And this was my front yard 28 years ago when my husband thought he wanted a normal front yard and normal meant grass, foundation plantings, non-native, and a lot of asphalt. Fortunately, entering a conversation with the land and all the other beings, nearby squirrels thought maybe they'd prefer a forest. Skipper butterflies suggested some blue stem, a little blue stem for their babies. Goldenrod uh, soldier beetles and many different bees thought goldenrod would be a good idea. Species like the nut, nut, nut hatch thought oak trees. So what's a new normal look like? In, the, in this case, in my front yard, a new normal is a forest. Polycultures, and this is the sound of my yard. And polycultures are Earth's technology for biodiversity and climate resilience. And this is a picture about 10 years ago. It's evolved again because it's a conversation. And when you let go of control, things change. There is a new study out called Why Native? And the study supports the research being done by Douglas Ptolemy, which probably many of you have heard about. And in this study, the native versus non-native and the support that they gave meant 50% more native birds appeared when you planted native species, nine times more rare birds, three times more butterfly species, like this giant swallowtail, two times more native bees. Maureen Buchanan, one of my co-conspirators with Little Forest Kingston said the first time she visited the land on Highway 15, which is where we planted 900 um, saplings for a little forest this October. So the first voice she heard on the land wasn't in the first language, wasn't English. It wasn't Anishinaabe Moan. It was the language of the spring papers, which her made her realize, and thanks to her, me realize that the, we need to bring back all the languages to the land again. And Richard, Wakami says that he's been considering, this is before he died, all, the, all my relations. We are all connected. We all belong to each other. The most important world, word is all. Not just those who look like me, sing like me, dance like me, speak like me, pray like me, or behave like me. All my relations. It means every person. Just as it means every blade of grass, rock, mineral, like the ones being sipped up by these uh, butterflies, and creature. If we were to collectively choose to live that teaching, the energy of that change of consciousness would heal all of us and heal the planet. We do it one person, one heart at a time, like this um, kid from planting the little forest in Highway 15, meaning a praying mantis for the first time. We are connected. We are the answer. We share the same trampling for existence. Its future is unfolding, it's flourishing. These are feelings that any autonomous living creature experiences, Andreas Weber. What if we imagine our cities and our yards as multi-species gatherings in the making? Yeah. Unleashing all that asphalt and grass and inviting in these a nexus of community justice, nature, and environmental equity. This is the RHS Hampton, uh, and it was an award-winning garden called the Family Garden. And take a look at that, nothing like, um, and right now there's someone in Smith's Falls that's fighting a bylaw complaint around lumber in their yard waste. And look at this habitat. And imagine instead of just grass for kids to play on, if they had this as a natural world to, to have wonder and magic in. 
Melissa Nusachenko says, big stories are failing us, but we are citizens and inheritors and custodians of tiny landscapes too. It is the small stories that attach these places which might help us find a way through. My son's yard a year ago when he moved in, my son's yard in June, and you'll see the grass there still on the right. That's about, that actually has disappeared now this fall, being replaced all by native plants and food bearing plants, which mostly is what you see here. Melissa goes on to say, I am earth speaking, talking about this place, my home. This earth speaking is a small, quiet story in a human mouth. A city before and when it could become. A front yard before and white that might become. A strip mall. A bank, an asphalt parking lot. In another study, um, some scientists over in BC that are trying to protect an endangered tree frog said that they could put frogs in places that currently don't exist, or they can increase the amount of forest and spaces in the city, making it easier for frogs to hop around from urban pond to urban pond. Landowners must commit themselves to deeply understanding their land, how it works and what its potential is as a catalyst for the ecological, economic and social health of its surrounding area. So each of us, each of us can do that. Urban governance should not be about enacting barriers to creating ecological life worlds in which multiple species can flourish. This is the ditch across the street from my house, which at one point was ruthlessly mowed and had chemicals applied to it. And when the homeowner moved on, the next people stopped doing that and the grubs ate the ditch. And this is it about 15 years later, it's full of um, junipers and white, white pine and other native species. What will the neighbors think he might ask? We think it's awesome. I think most of them would have to say, so let's invite magic back into our cities. That's it from me. Thanks so much, Joyce, for that beautiful introduction to the power of naturalizing spaces. Um, I do see we have a couple of hands raised. I uh, just want to remind people that uh, you should be able to type any questions in the Q&A, and then we'll get to as many as we can uh, once we've heard all of the speakers. Um, so now I will pass it on to Vicki, who's going to speak a little bit more about the benefits of biodiversity. Yeah, uh, thanks so much, Jordan. I'm really appreciating the conversation. And um, my talk is going to follow up in a really great way on what Joyce said, stepping back to uh, the, the science and background of this value of urban biodiversity. There we go. So um, what can urban biodiversity do? We know it's there. What does it do for us? Um, simply put, it uh, from our perspective, you know, we're a little focused on pollinators, but it certainly supports all species. So it supports pollinator populations and urban pollination systems that can benefit the production of food in a city. Biodiversity can also build resilience more broadly in all of our other ecosystems. And again, when you hear me speak, you'll see that I speak in the present tense of urban areas being functional ecosystems because they are and we can make them better. Now, it can also mitigate the impacts of climate change. We'll talk about this just a little, but this is a huge, huge um, positive and uh, something that we can capitalize on. And lastly, biodiversity in urban areas provides psychological and social benefits. And those are clear to us that, that know that we can connect with nature, but there is evidence that's proven this as well. So pollination um, is really simple. We, most of us understand it as um, a pollinator and uh, an insect, perhaps a bee visiting a plant and that helping that plant reproduce. Uh, but Pollination is very important, not only in structuring our ecosystem, but also in looking at how we can um, provide food production because the plants that we eat, the food that we eat needs pollinators. So urban and suburban areas really do in fact have the potential to become biodiversity hotspots. Um, often 
this factor of dense human populations uh, and our individual likes and choices creates a really potentially or actually species rich and abundant environment. So in cities, we have a very heterogeneous landscape in terms of who owns the land and what you can do with it. Diverse people plant diverse plants, plant diverse gardens, and we have actually a very highly diverse ecosystem. Turf glass, unfortunately, um, we know actually leads to uh, pollinator population decreases. So in the research that's out there, if we look at, um, it's very logical to us here in the pollinator world, but if we need the hard facts, when we do look at landscapes that are primarily lawn versus ones that provide beneficial um, floral species, there's less pollinators. Um, and the urban agricultural benefits that can be provided by urban biodiversity, which is supporting pollinators and fruit production are huge. So good habitat can lead to healthy native pollinator populations that will then pollinate urban food production systems. And this feeds into um, food security for certain populations, also helps um, just in terms of social economical benefits. And it's, um, it's a big bonus to looking at urban areas as places where you can actually get stacked multiple benefits. So here's some visuals just to go through what I, I um, went over. And when we have an urban landscape, as you can see in the top corner, all these individual homes and individual yards, again, we're opening it up to that potential of having really high diversity because one neighbor will plant this group of plants and one neighbor will plant that group of plants. And we know from the research that the more plants you have, the more pollinator types you have. And again, this um, leads to increased pollination. There's, um, there's proof from this as well. So there's been some research studies that have looked at urban agricultural production uh, in New York City in particular, and looking at gardens that either had pollinator habitat in them or were close to native habitat within the city, and those gardens that were just urban um, crops. And the gardens that were closer to uh, native plantings and natural habitats had more pollinators, also had more yield. So if you're an urban farmer or if you're actually a community member that really relies on growing your own fruits and vegetables as part of your diet, you're going to have more food if you have more pollinators. Um, and this is a nice shot of just the diversity of pollinators that we're talking about. And I like to show this picture because it's a global perspective, but of course um, uh, in North America, we don't have some of the more interesting honey possums uh, and lizards, but all of these species can be encouraged by plantings. And then they visit the various plantings, many of which are crops and can provide more food. The direct connection between pollinators and food, we know this story from agriculture, big production agriculture, but the same is true from our urban gardens. What do our food choices look like with bees? The bottom corner is when we do have lots of bees and pollinators, we have a full grocery store, similarly a full urban garden. But if we remove those pollinators, which is if we don't provide habitat for them in an urban context, we have the same scenario where we have far less opportunity to eat. And another point that's really important is that pollination, the way pollination works, the way we get our food from pollination is not just one pollinator visiting one flower and that's it, it happened, it's great. Flowers are really complex and more often than not, you need quite a few visits by a pollinator to make that fruit look really good. And the pictures of fruit I'm showing you here are fruits that have been partially or incompletely pollinated and they either don't develop or they don't develop into anything that's appealing for us to eat. So we need pollinators to make sure we have food in the first place and we need lots of pollinators to make sure that we have nice abundant food. Another factor outside of our food, I mean, we can all obsess about food, it's your lunch hour, so I'm sure we're all thinking about that. But another factor that's really important about urban biodiversity is the fact that it can build resilience and protect species. So I've alluded to this as I chatted about the food systems, but a dense and diverse population um, of plants really builds that dense and diverse population of pollinators. Uh, this can support pollinator networks, and I'll show an image uh, in a second that, 
explains why having many pollinators is actually ideal versus just having one. Uh, and it also can provide species, uh, pardon me, habitat for critical species or species at risk. So urban areas can be biological reserves. Sometimes there are cases in which there are species in urban landscapes that aren't um, present in the natural wildland landscape. Pollinators also contribute to a wide range of ecosystem service benefits beyond pollination. And many of these are occurring as well in cities. And in terms of um, the other biodiversity benefits that are directly uh, linked to our city ecosystems, we have things like pest control and cycling organic matter, which again, are functions that the cities are capable of if we allow them to be there because of the biodiversity we're supporting. So why do we need lots of pollinators and lots of plants? This image here is a depiction of what pollinator networks actually look like. It's not one species of pollinator going to one species of plant. It's usually many pollinators visiting many plants and a plant being visited by many pollinators. So the more diversity we have, the more stable the system is, the more connections there are. And that's a really important factor. And here's a shot of some of these species at risk that might be supported in urban landscapes. And these are the species at risk that you could potentially find in Toronto. And uh, two out of the three we likely won't see because they're doing far, far um, less well than, for example, the monarch butterfly. But for most people that live um, in southern Ontario, southern Quebec as well, we see monarch butterflies in our cities. And that is actually a species of, of concern. The bumblebee species we're showing you here is the rusty patch bumblebee. Unfortunately, this species is not um, largely present in Canada. However, its historic habitat includes areas that are now cities. So if you did plant the right plants, you're priming the habitat in that area for these species. Similarly, the Carner blue butterfly has had an incredible restriction in its range, but its historic range includes cities that could include the diverse plantings that these species are interested in visiting and feeding off of. And here's just the shot to put into con uh, context where we actually have biodiversity benefiting us. We don't always think about this right away, but the clothes we wear, the pharmaceutical products that um, keep us healthy, those are derived by and large from the plant world and those plants require pollination. So without biodiversity supporting pollinators, and pollinators pollinating the plants that then we make our clothes, our homes with, um, that we get medications um, and all these scientific opportunities from, uh, we'd be in far worse shape. And on the natural side of things, these ecosystems that are supported by pollinators that are supported by biodiversity, buffer against climate change, for example, um, and extreme weather effects such as um, flooding and landslides. And we know these are happening even in North America. We're not used to this, but it is happening more often. Um, sea level rise can be buffered by coastal communities. And again, all of these ecosystems are in cities, depending on where that city is located. <clears throat> so um, here's another little, very sciencey example of all of these ecosystem services and how they're related to biodiversity. And I'm just putting this up here for your record. We certainly don't have to look at the details, but um, the arrows have different colors. Uh, green is go, green is usually good. Um, yellow is slow down or average and red is stop or, or negative. And it's uh, a long-term study that compiled thousands of research papers that looked at how biodiversity actually impacts these ecosystem services. And the, the truth is that for the vast majority of them, you see the majority of these arrows are green. So in most cases, having high diversity actually drives more crop yield, more wood production, even in um, things like fisheries. Uh, doesn't seem like it makes sense, but it does. It, it drives um, aquatic ecosystems as well. Uh, pest control is um, the impacts of pests are reduced in a positive way by having increased biodiversity. So biodiversity is really important. And all of these functions take place in a city as well. Now, what about climate change and the impact of climate change? And how could biodiversity in a city actually help us make some positive steps towards mitigating uh, climate, uh, climate action? Well, plants uh, by their basic life history sequester carbon. So the more vegetation that we plant in, in cities, 
the better off we are. And we are trained to think that trees are the be all and end all of mitigating climate change, but any um, plant-based landscape has value. Prairies, so meadows, your lawn transferring into a native plant community has good carbon sequestration value. So that's a benefit that we're getting by increasing the biodiversity in our cities. Um, and again, I've mentioned this topic before, but when we have a diverse ecosystem, we're stacking the odds in our favor. There's a lot of species there. We don't wanna lose a species, but if we lose one, but we have a lot, we're a lot better off than if we have a few species and we lose one. And another interesting factor about how urban areas and the biodiversity in them can interact um, and participate with um, climate action, climate change mitigation, is that urban areas can actually become microclimates and microhabitats that provide opportunities for species that are losing their critical habitat due to climate change. So perhaps it's an extended season in um, the bloom of a plant species. Perhaps it's replacing a lost habitat or creating an entirely new novel ecosystem, a healthy urban ecosystem that species are finding a home in. So again, reiterating everything I said, you know, anything that's a plant has this quality of sequestering carbon uh, as it grows. So planting a diversity of plants really helps us achieve these goals, even if we can't plant trees. A diverse landscape hedges our bets for us. Again, we have multiple species out there. So the more species that are there, the better the odds are that we're going to last into the future. And I like to mention the climate change aspect and pollinators just to put stuff into context. So there's two images here that I'm showing you that highlight some studies that show what pollinators actually, um, these super important animals that help us get the food we eat and structure our ecosystems, what they're going through as the climate is changing. And the one that's the graph is actually showing you the time at which a black currant plant normally blooms versus the time at which the bee that pollinates it emerges. And what you see historically uh, back in the 1970s, and this is not that long ago, they occurred at the same time, which is quite logical. The plant blooms, the pollinator emerges, plant gets pollinated, pollinator gets food, everything's great. Because of um, a changing climate and changing annual temperatures, what we're seeing now is that the plant's bloom isn't really impacted that much because plants respond to a photo period, the amount of daylight they're getting much more so than temperature. Insects, on the other hand, are very dependent on temperature when they develop. And as the temperature changes, we're seeing that the bee is actually emerging earlier in the season than the plant that it's looking to feed off of and pollinate. And in some cases, it's as much as a 10 day difference on average, which uh, is pretty significant and pretty severe, given that some of these species life cycles are only about a month long um, in the adult phase. So that is quite concerning. And the second image, which shows a goldenrod, um, comes from a study that looked at the nutritional value of pollen as the atmospheric carbon has increased. And it found that um, pollen is becoming less nutritionally dense. So this is a problem for, for bees that don't know that. They can't just eat more because now the food they're eating doesn't have as many calories, um, proteins, amino acids, and fats in it. Uh, so over time, we're seeing that pollinators are using the same effort and getting less food, which impacts the amount of reproduction they can do. So how could urban areas uh, help with this in any way? Well, um, at least in terms of, you know, the phenology, when a plant blooms, there is evidence from research that shows that urban areas, because they're managed, if they're managed uh, with, uh, if we manage them correctly and we, and we do the right thing, we actually can provide habitat for critical species. And um, this example here is showing you a creosote bush in the desert southwest in the United States. And it was becoming increasingly popular to pr plant these drought tolerant species um, in the urban settings uh, rather than lawns in cities like Tucson, Arizona. And there was a long-term study that looked at what exactly is happening to the native population of bees that would be feeding on creosote bush in the wildland versus the bushes that are in the city. And they found that the actually the urban habitat was providing 
um, filling a gap, I should say, when the natural habitat was either out of bloom or no longer available. And what we're going to see more and more of is challenges in wild species that don't have any husbandry from us as humans, right? Uh, with climate change. But if we are managing an urban system, we can actually help uh, manage some of those species and provide extra habitat, manage the biodiversity correctly. And the last little benefit of, of biodiversity, just, there, there's a lot. So, and I went through this very quickly, but I don't want to discount the psychological and social benefits that are provided by biodiversity. Um, not all green space is created equal. And there's evidence that shows that as biodiversity increases and the right biodiversity increases, so does the mental health of people visiting and using those landscapes. And there's quite a lot of research showing this, um, as well as links with uh, economic indicators and um, ecosystems that are more diverse within urban areas. And if one begets the other is um, a, a separate concept, but they are quite correlated that you have healthier, more vibrant communities with more biodiversity. And anyone actually can do more biodiversity through the planted ecosystem. We're, we're not asking people to do something um, unattainable. We're just asking that lawn to get changed to something that provides some biodiversity for the species. There's a lot of um, research that shows that as we get more diverse populations of birds visiting these more diverse spots, people's satisfaction with the neighborhood that they live in just increases. People are happier when they see and hear those birds singing. And we do know that spending time in nature really helps increase happiness, energy, and decrease anxiety. It's probably because that's where we're from. We're from nature. We're not from uh, barren concrete landscapes. So um, again, reiterating all these points with pictures for you, the restorative benefit. So how good that landscape makes you feel correlates with how many species are in that ecosystem. There's uh, research supporting this factor. So it's true, not just because we say so, it is actually um, validated. This diversity of bird species that, um, again, those of us that work on pollinators often focus on the insects, but the birds are better studied and um, better indicators of how people are experiencing nature. There's, there's quite a wealth of information on how birds and human um, psychology go together in terms of uh, ecosystem services. And just the last photo to end you up on just how we, we as people really like nature, we're happy. I mean, I'm sure we could be happy in a city too, but we have a lot of great smiling faces and a lot of good energy when we're out in nature. It's restorative, it's regenerative, uh, we all love it. So I'll leave that there um, and pass it on to Patricia and Emma, and I'm looking forward to questions that show up in the chat just about how important biodiversity is in urban landscapes. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for joining us today. I want to thank Jordan and Vicki and Joyce for setting the groundwork for a, a great discussion and the main reason I think we're here. Um, you know, Vicki touched on the importance of um, food security, urban biodiversity, mitigating climate change, and ultimately human health, including mental health, and the importance of that in nature. So I'm so happy that you, you, you've all set that groundwork for me. Um, so I'm just going to speak uh, quickly through this because we did a dry run yesterday and we were about 10 minutes over, Emma and I. So, um, and of course, I'm the chatty one, so it's mostly my fault. So um, I'm just going to give a bit of background to our um, original bylaw. When I first took on the role as a natural garden inspector, if you can believe that was one of my titles, um, I was basically told to look at the, make sure it was neat and tidy. So of course, aesthetics was first and foremost and to follow the noxious weeds list. So um, one of my, my big concerns was the, uh, there's a lot of gray area when you're dealing with uh, living plants, living things, 
Uh, it's never black and white. People were really set on a black and white list, both homeowners and the municipality itself. Um, so that wasn't going to work. In fact, I, I kind of thought of renaming this 50 Shades of Plants, <laughs> but didn't think it would go over well. So I'm just going to give a quick background here. So originally it was based on a height restriction. Um, we had a, a there was a starting to be a movement for naturalized gardens or people growing other things other than a, you know, a um, conventional lawn on their properties. So in 1996 and 2002, um, our bylaw was challenged by some great homeowners, shout out to Douglas Counter and, uh, and um, Miss Bell. Um, so because of their, um, their challenge, it was the Ontario Superior Court of Justice that ruled that homeowners have the right to maintain a naturalized garden and not just a manicured lawn. Um, so it was in violation of uh, Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So in 2004, City of Toronto uh, bylaw was amended to include a nat natural garden exemption. Um, so that was the answer to that. But the um, problem with that, again, was putting the onus on the homeowner to that they were the exception and they had something different. And you know, we really, it shouldn't be that way at all. They should be all treated on the same level playing field, so to speak. Um, so what is a natural garden, naturalized garden? So just briefly, environmentally responsible, we, you know, pesticide and chemical free, but it's usually drought tolerant and water efficient with the use of uh, plant material that have adapted to that, to the climate um, and the conditions. It's practical, it's, you can, it can be native or non-native, um, uh, it doesn't have to be all native plant material, which a lot of people think is a natural garden. Um, and it's low cost and very low maintenance. Uh, uh, and these are all contrary to popular belief. Um, it's attractive. And I don't mean aesthetically looks pretty, I, although it does. <laughs> but it's, um, it provides habitat for pollinators and other wildlife. And it also provides interest with uh, a, a diversity of different plant species. Um, so... Um, it provides critical habitat for species at risk, and, and Vicki went well into that about um, species at risk. Thank you for doing that. Um, so it also provides year-round interest in a lot of uh, natural gardens. The I don't know, Emma, if it's going to work, my little video there, but um, it was just to the right is the uh, Verbena stricta, um, Hori Verbane, that was just outside the High Park um, greenhouse one day I just grabbed it and there had to be at least 50 different species of pollinators buzzing around on that and you can see it's it's just stuck in beside a, a very large expanse of asphalt so if you build it they will come <laughs> um, I'm not going to read the details of this but this is just showing how they incorporated the natural garden exemption into the existing bylaw so the existing bylaw was originally a height restriction it continued to be based um, initially on a height restriction, but then going into the exemption of a natural garden. Um, so weeds in Toronto. So um, I was watching, looking at our noxious weeds list, but it, it's uh, provincial legislation. It's based on, on agricultural lands and commercial greenhouse operations. So it was really never totally applicable in an urban setting. I also would consult with the Ontario Invasive Plant Council and used um, you know, local invasive weeds that um, they were dealing with, um, that they saw as important and significant in, in our area. Um, I just threw this in here because even the term weed doesn't sit well with me because essentially a weed is just a plant growing uh, in a place you don't want it. A lot of the, even um, our alien or invasive introduced species are native to somewhere and uh, would have would get along just fine and, and probably provide service elsewhere, um, but uh, they can be problematic. So I like to call them more problematic plants. <laughs> so struggling with those, dealing with uh, plant lists and um, um, other issues with uh, people wanting to grow things other than uh, mown lawn, I thought it was best to stick to three criteria as opposed to plant list, uh, but to um, use the plant list as well as a guide. Um, so number one, does the plant threatens, threaten a person's health? So there are obvious plants there. Uh, threatens our native plant communities. 
um, and our ravines and parks or invasive or um, introduced species? <clears throat> and do they pose a, or can they pose a potential safety hazard? So we'll just go quickly through this. Um, so first of all, the human health threats, the, there's some obvious ones. Again, you're gonna hit on some gray areas here. We have uh, ragweed, hogweed, uh, wild parsnip. Um, these are just some, some that I commonly um, encounter in the city of Toronto. Poison ivy, for example, even though it can, you know, some people I know have been hospitalized because they react so badly to it. It's all, it is native, um, but it, it, if you have it in like a ravine setting uh, with a slope, it can, it can actually provide a great erosion control service. So in some places, you know, it could be acceptable, but um, when you're talking about um, uh, an area that's, you know, direct exposure to a public sidewalk or something like that, then it's, you know, it's not a plant that you want around. So I just thought I'd throw that in the little gray areas of some of our plants. <laughs> um, so the next slide is our threats to biodiversity. So, you know, how can these invasive species threaten biodiversity? Um, and, and Vicki outlined the importance of urban biodiversity. Um, so displacing native species, it uh, can reduce critical habitat for our endangered and at-risk species um, and controls used can be very harmful to our native species as well. And a lot of them are vigorous growers. In fact, there's some invasive species that are, not only are they vigorous growers, but they're preferred by property owners and can be available for purchase commercially. So that adds an, a whole other twist for, um, you know, asking people to remove a plant because sometimes they're commercially available. So what we do is I see my role um, first and foremost as an educational outreach role um, because you, you hope that you can educate the homeowner if they have some of these invasive species that you can purchase at a, a, a retailer and, um, and offer alternatives that uh, would be as beautiful but still provide much more valuable um, ecosystem services. So, and again, the, um, the threat to environmental health. Um, you know, we, what we've done is we've come up with as an educational outreach role, it allows me uh, a chance to speak to homeowners so I can uh, provide them with inf information. So here's just a couple of examples. So on the, you see the um, Bishop's weed or um, the one of the, sorry, gout weed that is, Bane of our existence for a lot of people, and we offer alternatives. You know, here you can plant this instead. There's also a book that we have called Plant Me Instead, um, which is also very handy to have. And then, quite often, if I point out some of the worst invasive plants, most people will say, I didn't even know what that was. That's 90% of the response. And how do I get rid of it or how do I control it? So it's best to go, I, I'm all, always go armed with um, educational information that I can provide on the spot to people to say here let's this is what we found to be useful um, so and then the last was a safety concern that we talked about as third criteria so here are some examples of um, you know you can have a trip hazard where it's it's just all over the sidewalk where it's spilling out and it doesn't really matter what the plant material is if it's if it's causing a hindrance to somebody say in a wheelchair or, or somebody pushing a stroller or a kid on a scooter you know, then it can be uh, an issue. Um, and the one in the middle, <coughs> trip hazard, but also if you see behind that, it's, it's right at the edge of a driveway. So it can be problematic for someone to safely pull out of that driveway. And the final one, thank you, Lorraine, for this picture. Um, it's, it's, even though they're lovely flowers, it's still um, posing a, a site obstruction for that driveway at the end. So um, that was a, a good one to have in there. So again, a lot of gray because uh, again, it's a pretty flower, but if it's in the wrong place, it's not, it can be a problem. I just threw these up here. So quite often when you try to encourage people to have naturalized gardens or you, you just, you talk about them, people have this, these misconceptions or common myths. So goldenrod causes hay fever. So goldenrod, we sort of focused on that plant a lot this year. Um, there's some great work being done done by group uh, Project Swallowtail um, and putting a lot of focus on educating the public on the benefits of goldenrod as opposed to it always getting a bad rap that it's the one causing 
misery with people with hay fever. <clears throat> um, so that's not true. Natural gardens are messy and unkempt. Uh, lawns, also not true, as I'll show you. Um, properties left unmanaged will just naturally repopulate with native plant material. Not true at all. It's going to be those um, invasives that can outmuscle the native plant material. And natural gardens are expensive and require a lot of work. Um, also not true. There's, a, there's some work up, up front probably at the beginning, but um, eventually you get a, a garden as beautiful as, say, Douglas Counters, which is a boulevard garden, which is virtually weed-free, doesn't require even um, watering. It's fantastic. Uh, just so you know, that was that common myths and misconception slide. I had about six on there, so I whittled it down because I'm trying to shorten everything up. Uh, so again, uh, I don't think I have to, I feel like I'm preaching to the converted here today. So probably differentiating between ragweed and goldenrod, um, it's, it is a big, um, it's a big role for us constantly. It never goes away. Um, so on the left, I've got some images of ragweed that I've encountered at different um, um, inspection sites. And on the right, right of course, is goldenrod. And I'm sure most people are aware that the reason it gets the it's you know guilty by association is because they flower at exactly the same time, um, and then goldenrod has these big showy in like inflorescence that everybody notices walking down the street at the same time that they're sneezing and their eyes are watery, so they're always blaming goldenrod. Um, so next slide. So here I just I just quickly mentioned some of the the pros of goldenrod because I kind of focused on that as it's one of the most commonly encountered plants at these inspections I, I'm asked to visit and it's, you know, people see goldenrod and they phone and complain and think it's a weed is the, the, the in a nutshell. So of course it's a hardy native perennial commonly mistaken as a weed. It's a, a keystone species, um, meaning it has a, a huge impact on um, biodiversity and the eco ecosystem around it. Um, it can provide critical late season food sources for pollinators and other insects. You know, that's a time when there's not a lot around. There's not a lot of things flowering at that time. So goldenrod is so important and critical at that time of year. Um, it also acts as nesting and overwintering sites uh, for many of our native pollinators. Several species are native to Southern Ontario and the uh, flowers are showy yellow flowers as well as white. There's some white varieties from August to frost. So it's a long flowering plant as well. Um, and it, it produces small amounts of pollen and it's very heavy and sticky pollen. So even if you stuck your face in it, it's not gonna make you sneeze. It's not air, airborne. Whereas ragweed of course can travel up to like hundreds of kilometers um, on the wind. So this year, thank you to Project Swallowtail and there's one of their subcommittees. Um, we came up with this amazing fact sheet on get to know goldenrod. So I love handing this out to homeowners and um, it's a great one as well for people to have. And I'll provide all these uh, resources to anybody who's interested. So you can just fire me an email and I'm happy to send some along. Um, so natural gardens, just the, the other you know, myth that they're messy and unkempt. I just wanted to show these quickly. So again, uh, shout out to Douglas Counter for providing me with these beautiful slides of his garden. It's the one on the left. Um, and we're going to talk about boulevard gardens as too, because it's an extremely important um, issue as well currently. The middle one is one of my uh, garden award winners for the garden contest. We created an environmental category and a pollinator category. Um, so, so as we as we change with um, going from these conventional lawn ideas, I think it's time that we start to. Um, not only encourage, but support and also celebrate natural gardens because they, they do provide such an important uh, uh, service to our environment. And the last one is a volunteer run garden at a church. That was also one of our award winners. Um, and it was just an asphalt parking lot and they completely dug it all up. It was a lot of work. And they, you know, under this big, huge shady Norway tree, they have a uh, Norway maple, they have a bunch of benches and they, they um, give programs to children on nature in, in front of the church. So it's quite pretty. Um, let's see what I got next here. Okay, critical habitat. And, and you know what, I'm not even going to talk about this one because Vicki 
addressed it so thoroughly, um, but I just like to show those pretty pictures. <laughs> and uh, here we go. This is my, uh, it says, are you still dressed like this? Then why does your yard still look like this? I really like that. It hit home. Um, and we all know that, um, you know, manicured lawns are basically a, an old colonial style that was brought over with European settlers. It was a status symbol um, signifying wealth. Um, completely irrelevant these days. Um, uh, to me, seeing a naturalized garden shows a person that's much more environmentally responsible um, and in touch with what's going on. Um, no longer sustainable. We need to rethink aesthetics as well. So um, it's a desert to pollinators. I think Vicki mentioned that as well. It's extremely high maintenance. Chemicals often used for maintenance um, requires frequent watering, uh, gas powered machinery. So um, also, I, I wanted to throw this in, and I know Vicki spoke about it as well as food security, um, especially given uh, this day and age and the, uh, with the pandemic, we found that there was an increase in private properties requesting or contacting me asking if they could grow vegetables on the front lawn. And I'm like, absolutely 100%. Um, and it intensified during the pandemic. Um, in fact, our, I also was working with uh, allotment gardens and um, we have a, a huge waiting list for people wanting to, you know, people that are living in apartments and, and uh, condos that can't, that don't have a place, a space to grow. Uh, we have a waiting list for those allotments that people can rent. Um, yeah, so I thought this was just a fun slide to put up and, and point out the importance of that, that space in the, the front yard. Um, this was provided by um, another great natural garden supporter in, um, I believe, Kingston. Um, and this is, a, a, I think it was mid-July or end of July during a really long drought. And you can see the, it's kind of hard to see in the slide, but the naturalized boulevard there that is rich and flourishing and hasn't even been watered. So, um, and according to the uh, US um, EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency in the USA alone, there's 9 billion gallons of water per year used for landscape irrigation only. So that's equivalent to two glasses of water per every human being on the face of the earth. So that's a ton of water. Um, so yes, that uh, again, these are two good pictures of Douglas Counter's Boulevard Garden um, that are, you know, again, Vicki spoke um, in depth about mitigating uh, climate change. So it's uh, this is a great example. I believe it absorbs 95% of the storm uh, and water from storm surges. Um, and this used to be just a, a ditch. You can see further down the street that it was just a, a ditch for drainage and it would often um, flood, spilling a lot of storm water with chemicals and other pollutants down into the nearby creek and then ultimately emptying into Lake Ontario and our drinking water. So um, that's a great example of not only mitigating storm water and taking that pressure off of municipal infrastructure and saving money that way. Uh, imagine if all our city boulevards were naturalized, the amount of storm water that would be absorbed and, and not going into those um, storm drains. Um, so thanks for that, Douglas. And and this was not this did not come easy. This was Douglas uh, went through a lot to have that garden. Um, flowering lawns and other alternatives. So although it sounds like I'm really bashing lawns, <laughs> there's also there has been some um, changes and in a positive way. Uh, we've got flowering lawns are a great example. So you know I have three children. I also have three dogs. So we do have a bit of turf area in our backyard, but we have a flowering turf area. Um, so it's, um, you can't beat it for a recreational surface when it comes to those things. Um, and so I'm not, you know, people still like their lawns and a lot of people do, you know, I ask them to look at these alternatives. There's flowering lawns. There's also uh, seed, seed mixes now that are being developed that are more drought tolerant, shade tolerant, um, slower growing. So there's like no mow lawns where they're they literally just are these soft, like um, uh, soft grasses that just sort of flop over and you don't really have to mow them. So I just thought I wanted people to know that 
you can have alternatives to people that still want to hang on to that lawn. <laughs> um, this slide I, I put in because uh, it was really important for us to recognize that although we had the exemption in the bylaw, it still wasn't it still wasn't um, up to date and modernizing modernizing along with um, or aligning with our current and recently adopted pollinator protection strategy and our biodiversity strategy. They were both adopted in 2018 by city council um, and the actions that uh, part of the actions that we wanted um, implemented was to align other divisions with the city and other bylaws to be better aligned with our um, pollinator and biodiversity strategies. <clears throat> so um, our, our, our bylaw enforcement team in municipal licensing and standards had recognized this and were um, in the process of, of discussing changes to the bylaw. Um, and we started the process in, I, I guess about a year and a half ago, and uh, we made some significant changes to the bylaw. And I'm, you know, hoping that the next stage is, and I know that uh, speaking with Emma, they've already mentioned it, that they've already started to um, work with transportation. Transportation oversees the boulevards, which are public, it's, uh, sorry, city owned property. Uh, as opposed to the privately owned um, land on people's uh, property. But boulevards are also a great frontier to be naturalized. And so we are working on changes to uh, transportation's bylaws to make it easier for homeowners to naturalize their boulevards. And in fact, it should be um, hopefully that we can work together with other municipalities and even the province to have overarching uh, bylaws that will um, make it easier for uh, homeowners to, to do the right thing and, and naturalize and, and help support biodiversity. Um, I just wanted to show this really quickly because that's my last slide. Um, you know, here's a couple of examples of citizens doing the right thing and helping to support biodiversity. So. Um, our, I mentioned Project Swallowtail and Carolyn in Canada, World Wildlife Fund, um, having their in the zone program, which is amazing. Um, and you get these signs that you can put on your front lawn. Sometimes it just takes a, a lawn sign, or sorry, not a lawn sign, uh, a sign in your, your naturalized garden to signify to homeowners that, hey, maybe there's something I should be doing. Um, so, so thank you to all of you for um, helping to educate your neighbors and, um, and to implement and help and support them in their, their quest to naturalize uh, uh, private properties. And uh, also the Certified Backyard Habitat Program with World Wildlife Fund, or sorry, um, Canadian Wildlife Federation. And of course our bee books, I just got two boxes delivered to me today because I was fresh out. So our biodiversity series of booklets are available for free um, and they're great, great, um, tool to have for uh, working with your neighbors and, and helping to educate the public and also for us to realize how biodiverse our city really is. And sorry, I'll uh, turn it over now to Emma. <laughs> Thank you, Patricia. Um, so I'm just going to go into a bit more of the details of the bylaw review. Um, and so that's our view of the Toronto's grass and weeds bylaw, um, and more specifically how it relates to natural gardens. Um, and it's one piece of the puzzle in terms of updating our bylaws to align with those strategies, as Patricia mentioned. Um, so as part of the review, um, we consulted with subject matter experts as well as members of the public um, and received a lot of great feedback. Um, first, um, we had overwhelming public support for removing the requirement for um, landowners to have to apply for an exemption to have a natural garden um, on their property. Um, and then from our subject matter experts, uh, we heard that bylaws should be focused on ecological and human health rather than nuisance and aesthetics, um, as well vague and subjective terminology should be removed. All properties and all vegetation should be treated equally. Um, turf grass requires a high level of maintenance, which should be reflected in regulations. 
Um, as well as Patricia mentioned, our bylaw previously referred to the Ontario noxious weed list. Um, and we heard that the bylaw should clearly state um, plants that are prohibited on private property um, in the bylaw. Um, and then kind of on the other side of the coin, we did receive feedback um, from other members of the public that were concerned about the city's ability to enforce against neglected and vacant properties with overgrown vegetation. Um, and we did also hear from some members of the public that they don't like natural gardens um, and that they were concerned about them harboring pests. Um, so that's just kind of the breadth of feedback we received. And so we kind of took all of that um, and um, into our changes for the bylaw. Um, so we brought a report to our city council in the spring of this year um, and it was adopted. And so bylaw changes will be coming into effect in January 1st of 2022. Um, so I'll refer to our old bylaw as the current bylaw since it's still in force and then updated bylaw changes will be coming into effect um, in the next month, which is exciting. Um, so as Patricia kind of alluded to in our current bylaw, um, owners or occupants of private land have to cut grass and weeds um, when they exceed 20 centimeters in height and are required to remove the grass cuttings. Um, as Patricia mentioned, grass and weeds um, are kind of confusing terms. They review, refer to noxious and local weeds and vegetation not part of a natural garden. Um, so in the updated bylaw, uh, we, made, we have maintained this height restriction, but we've clarified that the intention is for it to apply to a turf grass or a traditional lawn. And we've also removed the requirement for grass cuttings to be removed because we know they provide benefits. Um, and as well, turf grass is defined in the bylaw and the intention is to speak to um, traditional lawns and turf grass. Um, so moving towards a natural garden exemption, as Patricia mentioned, um, currently in our bylaw, owners of private land may apply for an exemption to be exempt from that height requirement. And that height requirement is common amongst bylaws in North America. Um, and so as part of that application, um, an individual would apply, the local counselor will be notified, and then Patricia would inspect the lawn. Um, a, dis a choice would be made whether to accept or reject it and there was an appeal process in place. Um, so in our updated bylaw, we've removed that requirement entirely. Um, natural gardens will be continue to be allowed as of a right, um, and they will be required to um, have maintenance standards in place as, long, as well as all other properties in the city. Um, so currently in our bylaw, only natural gardens have certain maintenance conditions that they have to meet, um, and they're, a bit, um, they're not necessarily very clear or very specific. For example, natural gardens will, re will remain well maintained um, and they will be kept free of noxious weeds. And again, that refers to the Ontario noxious weeds list. Um, so in our updated bylaw, we've maintained these kind of maintenance requirements um, to support ecological as well as human health and safety, um, but they now apply to all um, all private land in the city and all types of vegetation. Um, so the first new requirement will be that private land be kept free of prohibited plants. Um, and that's an updated local list that will be in the bylaw. Um, and as well, vegetation growth will not be allowed to obstruct sidewalks or roadways um, or sight lines. Um, and so that aligns with our requirements for boulevards as well. Um, and so um, the prohibited plant list, which is here, um, it has 10 species um, and it will re replace all references to the Ontario list. Um, this will be included in the bylaw. Um, we received a lot of feedback um, from a lot of experts on this list as well. Um, and we heard kind of a lot of different feedback um, on one side that the list should be um, very lean, easy to enforce and only focus on those like the worst of the worst species um, that would have an impact on ecological health or human health. And then on the other side of the coin, we heard from some experts that um, this should be a bit of a longer list and could be a really important tool in terms of preventing private landowners from having a lot of invasive species on their property. Um, so we kind of balanced that and came up with this list of 10 species. Um, noting that this is kind of um, a fluid list. It is in the bylaw, but we know that we will have to kind of review it 
um, and take feedback on it on an ongoing basis. Um, and then the last change here is the bylaw name. Our current bylaw is the grass and weeds bylaw. However, we heard that those, those terms are not clear. Um, and so this is actually one, one of the harder parts of the bylaw review was coming up with a new name. Um, so we've gone with the turf grass and prohibited plants bylaw. Um, I, won't, I won't say it's catchy or easy, easy to say, um, but it was kind of the best alternative that really was quite descriptive in terms of the intention um, of the updated bylaw. Um, and so, as I mentioned, our amendments come into force on January 1st. Um, and between the time that it was adopted and coming into force, we know that there are a lot of really important um, implementation actions in needed to ensure that this change is successful. Um, so first is public education. As the other speakers have talked about, there are so many benefits to natural gardens, but it's still, um, it's still not common kind of within members of the public. Um, so we'll be working with our partners to kind of improve messaging from the city and improve educational tools um, to kind of change, change their narrative on natural gardens. Um, the next is enforcement training. Our bylaws enforced by enforcement officers. So it's really critical that they understand kind of the rules, the species. So that's a really important part. Um, and then the next is kind of the ongoing review process. Um, we had a lot of really invested stakeholders that were extremely helpful in this review. Um, so we really like to maintain those relationships and ensure that our bylaw kind of um, is changed over time and just reflects the reality of um, the city of Toronto. Um, so I'll end it there um, and stop sharing and I'll, Jordan, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you, Emma and Patricia, that was great. Um, so I do recognize we have gone a little bit over. Um, I see we have some questions that have come in though uh, that seem to mostly be directed to uh, Emma and Patricia. So I just wanted to double check uh, if you guys had a few minutes to answer questions. Yep. Okay, perfect, thanks so much. Uh, and we are recording this, so we'll make it available uh, in the future. So if anybody does have to jump off, um, just know that. Uh, so I see one of the questions that's come in is, does the Ontario Superior Court of Justice ruling re-naturalized gardens that I believe was referenced in Patricia's section uh, mean that other provinces need to abide by this as well? Uh, this is a question asked by someone from BC. Um, Go ahead, Emma. I, I would say that's a great question, and I, I don't know. I wouldn't want to say something wrong, not, not knowing the, um, the legislation there. As I did mention, it, it, would, be, um, it would be nice to work um, provincially and, and with other municipalities as well um, to, you know, maybe even meet and discuss um, how it can affect other provinces and to work with them to craft something that would be um, similar across the board or just in consultation to help develop something for different provinces. Um, and if that would be, you know, obviously plant material is going to change uh, from one location to another, but um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, and another question that came in is, does the city of Toronto try to control dog strangling vine and buckthorn in parks? It never ends. It's, uh, you know, I think a lot of our, our restoration crews that work in all the watersheds that have been uh, battling it for decades, um, it never ends. And I have to, this is, I have to give a big shout out to all the volunteers across the city that work with us in our, our, not, our uh, stewardship programs, our friends of programs. Um, uh, uh, unfortunately, 90% uh, of their work um, in our parks and ravines is um, invasive plant control. Um, but yeah, it, we, uh, it, we barely keep our heads above water when it comes to those species, with, but it's because of volunteers that um, we're managing it um, somewhat. But yeah, we know it's an issue. It's hard to keep up. That's why I guess it's so critical for homeowners. And that's why I try to explain to homeowners, even though you may think you have a small patch, 
you're right next door to um, High Park or uh, one of our ravines. So it doesn't take much for it to spread um, any of the uh, invasives that we have on the prohibited plant list. And uh, we have a, a fun question, which is what kind of prizes do you offer for the, the Garden Awards? Oh, you'll have to enter to find out. But uh, we've had um, we've had a range of different prizes. So I always, the, the fun one is um, uh, we have changed. I've always given away a package of tulip bulbs that is called Toronto. It's actually a, a tulip bulb that was developed specifically for the city of Toronto. Um, and then I thought, well, we have these, when the pollinator strategy started happening, um, I put together uh, a mix of bulbs that some are native, some aren't, but, uh, but they are pollinator friendly in that pollinators like them and they're very early spring flowering. So that's one of the prizes. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, that sounds great. Uh, and then we have one interesting question, which is, Say there's a boulevard garden and the house is sold, then the new owner decides not to keep the boulevard garden neat and it turns wild over time. So what would the Toronto bylaw do in that case? Um, I can start Patricia and then if you yeah, want to go add. ahead. Um, so as Patricia mentioned before, um, boulevard gardens, um, so they are city owned property that is required to be maintained by the person living in the property align or adjoining to that. Um, is regulated under our streets and sidewalks bylaw. Um, so the requirements there are slightly different from the grass and weeds bylaw. Um, so the requirements there are that grass is cut at 20 centimeters, so there's a height restriction there, and that other vegetation other than trees needs to be maintained um, when it exceeds 85 centimeters. Um, and also boulevards um, are not permitted to have noxious weeds under the noxious, or under the Ontario noxious weeds list. Um, so in that case, um, if the garden turns wild over time um, in that um, noxious weeds um, pop up or the garden kind of falls onto the sidewalk or restricts a sight line, um, then the homeowner would or occupier would need to um, manage it to ensure that it complied with those regulations. Um, as Patricia mentioned, we, we know that um, the grass and weeds, or the sorry, the streets and sidewalks bylaw does need to be reviewed in the same way we reviewed the grass and weeds bylaw. Um, it's kind of on the list for the future, but due to capacity reasons, we, we weren't able to align it with the review we just did. Um, yeah, hopefully that answers your question. And Patricia, please feel free to add on. Great, you nailed it. Great, thank you. Uh, and another question is, how long did it take to review the bylaw? And I'd like to tack onto that, uh, was public consultation uh, a part of that process? Yeah. Um, so in 2018, um, the biodiversity strategy came out and an action of that strategy um, was to review the grass and weeds bylaw. Um, so we kind of started, there was also a Toronto Ombudsman report that pointed out that the grass, that the natural garden exemption process um, was flawed, essentially. Um, so we kind of started thinking about it, um, but kind of due to capacity and COVID, um, we really started, I would say, in the fall of 2019 and then reported out on it in kind of spring of 2020. Um, yeah, and then so in terms of um, public consultation, um, we, we thought about so we um, advertised on our website and kind of asked for feedback on specific questions related to whether the public supported the natural garden exemption. Um, and so that was advertised via social media. And we did receive about 450 emails, which is quite helpful for members of the public. Um, we didn't really hold public town halls, noting that the nuances of the bylaw are very technical. Um, so instead we um, had a subject matter expert panel um, and we held a couple of smaller meetings with those folks to really go over um, the kind of, um, the, very, the detailed aspects of the bylaw to um, get, their, um, get their input. And then as well, we did do some separate consultations with a bit of a broader group of subject matter experts on the prohibited plants list. Great, thank you. And one last question we have, uh, why is English ivy 
uh, not on the prohibited plant list. Um, I see it taking over in woodland areas and choking out native plants. Very good question there. I mean, I could add to that list, um, Vinca, you know, um, gout weeds, I get, um, English ivy, the list goes on and on. Um, again, it's, it's really, it's that sh those shades of gray for, for me from what my role is um, because it's, you know, for sure, there's a lot of people in our division who would love to see those um, on that list. But again, we had to work with a lot of, um, you know, other people that use those plants for dry shade areas, things like that. So it was, it was difficult to um, also prohibit a plant that you can purchase at the garden center down the street. So it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's not over yet, but <laughs> there's, uh, you know, there is a lot of our staff myself uh, that I work with that would send me a whole bunch of plants that are commercially available. But um, yeah, so it's, it's tricky when they're commercially available at a retailer to have that on the list. So the best we can do, as I said, is public education is key here. And it, just to mention to your neighbors, if you see them planting it, I've done it. And uh, some are receptive, some sort of are indifferent, but um, just offering alternatives, that's the key is saying, well, there's some, a really great native plant that will do even better in this dry shade that you have. And, and you know, coming up with uh, ideas. I've even gone so far as to drop plants on people's porches <laughs> and said, can you plant this instead of that? But uh, yeah, yeah it I'll is just, tricky. I'll just add to that. On the practicality side, um, Patricia is a, is a wonderful support, but most of the bylaw is enforced by our enforcement officers who are generalists who don't really know plants. Um, so one of the things we considered in coming up with that list was what, um, what do we think will actually be successful on the ground and what are plants that um, can, can, can our enforcement officers can learn and can um, kind of share that information with members of the public. I would like to add two to that, Emma, just to reassure people um, that there will be even even if I'm gone one day, um, that it, we will always be um, working in partnership with by law enforcement, our division, Parks, Forestry and Recreation, and there will always be um, 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 experts in horticulture or uh, plants that will work with by law enforcement to ensure that uh, plants are identified properly. Hopefully. Yeah, that is, that is great to hear. Um, so thank you everybody for, for staying on a little longer. Um, I think that's all the time we have for today, but this was, this was great to get in lots of questions too. Uh, so thank you to our speakers for offering your knowledge today. Uh, and thank you for everybody who tuned in and took the time to listen. Um, so I hope that everybody has a wonderful holiday, uh, and we hope to see you in the new year for, uh, for upcoming webinars, potentially in January. I Thank you, everybody, and thanks for coming. And uh, if you have any questions or want any of my resources, just email me at patricia.landry at toronto.ca and everybody else. I think Emma's was up there as well.